So, welcome uh, to, uh, to the last session for today. Uh, it is my pleasure to have a session that will be looking somewhat into the future. It's titled uh, Challenges when going towards a thousand qubits. Uh, there's plentiful challenges around there. There are plentiful challenges even way before a thousand qubits. And uh, as uh, Zurich Instruments, we have uh, our mission, which is to help build the quantum computer. We want to stay ahead of the curve so that our control electronics, which we consider our task, do not become any limiting factor. And uh, for the control hardware layer looking towards the thousand qubits, there are kind of three main things that we are really thinking very hard about. And this is price per channel, volume per channel, and power per channel. So these are the, it's kind of obvious, the three things that on the hardware level we have to get down. There's another bunch of things that we have to get up. Configuration speeds, performance, uh, more software related topics on the software layer. Uh, better, more abstraction from the hardware layer and uh, more integration of third, third party software. So at Zurich Instruments, we believe we need to be as open as possible, get Qiskit, for example, and other quantum pieces of quantum software pieces into our stack, be it optimal control C3, for example, or um, uh, the Q control, other examples, those are people we have to integrate as openly as possible. And, but not only those commercial ones, also the kind of more individual ones that we have in the labs. That's also why we build our QCCS software in Python and have it open source so that it is as transparent as possible. Yeah, so scaling up, um, maybe it's a good way Good, way, good, good point to start with by looking back a little bit. Uh, generation one is uh, when we had our UHF QA and the HDAWG, and we combined them, and we had our full, first uh, fully quantum computing control system, the first one that was commercially available. Today we are looking at generation two. So we've done the first circle. Generation two is what you see today, much higher integration, uh, IQ mixers are gone. We have uh, integrated way more components into our instruments. And the hardware is here. The evolution will continue for the next years to come. Those instruments, the hardware will stick around for quite a long time. In software, firmware, things will get more functionality and improve the performance. That's not going to stop. And then this is here. We're already thinking about the next generation, and the next generation will see a dramatic increase of density, in terms of uh, channel density. We will have to make sacrifices in terms of uh, functionality. It's obvious when you integrate stuff 10 times denser that you can't have everything. Um, and this is also one of the big challenges we face as a company, because we want to make products that will work for everybody and we want to stay ahead of the curve, but we won't, don't want to compromise on functionality too soon. We want to take, need to take stuff where we believe, hey, this is going to stick around, commercialize it, which takes years to harden it uh, and uh, thereby help the entire community. On the other hand, if we're too fast, uh, and if we had a thousand qubit control system today, we wouldn't have anybody to sell it to. And probably we would have made wrong assumptions. So this walk on this very fine ridge of making decisions on when to commercialize things and when to rather wait to, uh, for stuff to distill and be clear enough to, to be on the cutting edge there, but not too far, that's kind of the... Uh, one of the very exciting challenges that we face. Good. So, in order to uh, have the boss uh, to, to sharpen our outlook into the future, um, we invite uh, five guests to the stage. And um, so there's uh, Stefan Philipp from the Walter Meissner Institute, 
and uh, Jan Goertz. Please come and join me on the stage. Uh, Jan Goertz from IQM, Anna uh, Stickklauser from Rigetti, Natalia Ares is online, and uh, Michael Furs, uh, Förster from Quant. And so those three seats we have for our superconducting people, then the photonic outlier, because he, he's so lonely here, I'll have him next to me. And uh, Natalia will be online. <coughs> so to start with, we have an uh, introduction round where we have some slides and each of you will have some time to tell us your story. And we start with Natalia. Um, oh, just a second, Natalia. Oh, Natalia. Yeah. Now uh, you're on the sound. Sorry, the there sound. I am. Hello, and uh, well, thank you again for making uh, possible for me to show in this panel, even even online. And uh, well, my name, as um, uh, as you know, is uh, Natalia Ares, and I'm an associate professor here at University of Oxford. And my group uh, mainly focuses on. Um, on applying machine learning to the control of uh, quantum devices in real time. And this is, again, one of the things that um, that Sadiq was, was uh, touching uh, to, which is that, you know, we would have, um, let's say, southern of these devices to control, to characterize, to tune. This is um, even at the lowest level, very time consuming and it won't be able to scale without a machine learning techniques that can be integrated in the um, even in, in the lowest level instruments like AWGs, um, uh, high frequency logging amplifiers and so on. So one, one of the uh, points that I would make uh, today is that, uh, well, we need these machine learning techniques to accelerate uh, the the scaling of quantum devices uh, to more complex circuits. Uh, also, one of the things we are investigating in our group has to do with quantum energetics and how these complex circuits um, thermalize, how they dissipate, and uh, what we should expect in terms of operating with uh, states that have coherences in terms of energetics. And uh, because I... Uh, you know, as, as you can see from my slide, actually, uh, you know, our goal is to take these machine learning techniques in a way that it's, you know, completely um, uh, agnostic of the platform. And I know in the panel today we have some uh, representatives of uh, superconducting qubits and uh, photonics and uh, realization. So I thought I would take it on to... Um, even if I think that uh, right now we should be taking an approach that is realization agnostic, uh, I taken the approach to to vote for the semiconductor devices, and in particular there we had uh, this year quite exciting uh, breakthroughs. So we have uh, seen how uh, three groups uh, actually at more or less the same time came uh, to demonstrate that we are one step closer to error correction in semiconductors. And one of the questions that uh, for sure everybody asks is, why should we bother with semiconductors? Shouldn't we stick to something that it's uh, where, where the realizations are I mean, uh, farther ahead in terms of number of qubits? The reason is scalability. Again, that um, these systems hold potential because we know uh, because of um, microchip technology nowadays, we know how to pack many of these devices. So that's exactly the attract of these. And as you can see, my slides are uh, different companies that are involved in this effort, from companies like IBM to Intel and Microsoft to uh, startup companies um, uh, that that are trying to make this possible in, in, in different uh, semiconductor realizations. And here again, I'm all up for let's try different ones and let's see what, what works. Uh, and, and, and that's actually one of the things we've been uh, prioritizing in the development of the machine learning techniques to, to, to make algorithms that are robust across architectures. So we have some, you can see some, some images here. You have some 
uh, CMOS uh, devices, FinFET, silicon FinFETs, we have laterally defined uh, gates, we have donors in silicon, and we have some ideas of how to scale this up with um, as a community, right? Uh, when I say we, <laughs> uh, and we have some ideas of how to scale this in, in terms of multiplexing and and how we would get the electronics and the signals that we need um, to to control these um, uh, these circuits. Uh, so, well, that's that's uh, me, and uh, thank you again. Thank you, Natalia. Now uh, let's switch to the slide deck that we have here. And the first slide uh, will uh, dictate the order. <laughs> <laughs> ah, oh. here we go. Uh, okay, <laughs> hit me. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure actually to, to be part of this panel discussion here. And I'm a proponent of superconducting qubits, uh, as it Anna and then Jan here on the same side. So I'll take the opportunity to introduce the system and then you can just add what I think is good and what are the nice features. So maybe a little bit on my person, if that's so. I'm working at the Technical University of uh, Munich as uh, in the chair of physics. And I'm also at the Walter Meissner Institute. And what our goal is to uh, first develop superconducting qubit systems, develop new technologies, develop new materials, but also on the other side work towards scalability and then try to get a um, practically sized system where we can do something with it. So why superconducting qubits? We like them because we have nonlinearity in these circuits, so we have qubits. Um, we like them because there is microwave frequencies and that's why we have then some electronics companies that uh, know how to deal with microwaves uh, pretty well. So that's pretty good so that we can also with the good, uh, with these interactions that we have get to gates of a few nanoseconds and they can be high fidelity. That's also one of the challenges, getting even higher gate fidelities. I can just throw in right now that still is a challenge and will always be a challenge. Stable operation, I mentioned already, uh, we can operate in for days or so with a little bit of recalibration, so that's good. We don't have to uh, reset up every day in the morning. And we can also rely on fabrication technology that we have at hand. The demonstrated potential is something that is good actually, and that's bad for kind of uh, keeping up or showing that one can, can go beyond state of the art, but at least we know by now that we can have something that works up to the level of 50 or even 100 qubits already decently, so we have a good uh, starting point already. There was a point about the challenges on this slide, if you just click once. And that's, I think, then the basis for discussion. What is it? Coherence. We always have to work on better materials and interfaces. We discussed a lot about control. The third point is kind of our qubits are qubits, uh, but uh, we also know that they are not the perfect qubits. So we need to get rid of some of the levels, uh, and that kind of calls for probably other types of qubits. Fabrication we can do, but getting this reproducibly done is definitely a challenge for large-scale systems. And then crosstalk. And at the end, it's all about scaling up and keeping all the nice properties for single and two qubits and getting this also for large-scale integrated devices. All right. Uh, thank you, Stefan. And uh, then we continue with Anna. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, just a little bit about myself. I've been at Rigetti for four years now, and I'm currently working on um, product strategy at Rigetti overall, but my background is on the experimental side, so I've before that um, overseen the build of the first quantum computer we have in the UK, and, um, and also worked on um, simulation-driven design of the, of the actual circuits. Um, yeah, so Rigetti is a, is a full-stack quantum computing company that um, builds quantum comp uh, processors for commercial applications, and um, Full stack for us really means everything from the chip itself th oh, through packaging, through um, any of the, the signal chain, um, all the control electronics, and then also all different layers of the software stack, including the compiler um, and all the way up to, to the user interface, really. So we see scaling challenges basically across the entire stack. Um, and it's interesting to see where the biggest challenges lie for us. Um, 
our processes can be accessed through Quantum Cloud services, and they can be um, accessed. Um, they can be integrated in any public um, and and private cloud. And one example for that is that you can access them through AWS. Um, so that's kind of the the state where we are right now. But obviously, something we are current always expanding. And in terms of the the scaling challenges, one really important point for Rigetti's strategy is to use a modular device architecture, which is outlined here on this slide. Um, so what is at the heart of that is basically that we have a large, um, a large quantum chip, which is a carrier device, and then we can use flip chip bonding to bond devices with individual quantum circuits onto that large carrier device. And those um, yeah, that, that approach basically helps us to overcome um, a few really important scaling challenges, and one of them is, for example, the, the fabrication yield of these devices, that we can, um, yeah, we can really make big improvements on that using that technique. I can talk a bit more about that as we go on in the discussion. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Anna, for the overview, and then we continue with Jan. Yeah, so also a big thanks from my side uh, for organizing this. I think it's great to bring the community together and, and all the different players. Uh, about me, uh, I got my education actually here in Munich, the uh, physics education, and, and did my PhD at the Walter Meissner Institute, and then uh, continued my scientific career in, uh, in Finland at Aalto University, um, where at, at some point we realized that building quantum computers holds a lot of challenges. Um, and um, it's good that, that people work on the individual challenges, but of course it's also necessary if you want to build a large-scale device that someone has this kind of systems overview um, and and this was one of the motivating uh, factors to create a company um, to make sure that there is some kind of system um, integration and um, what, what I learned, of course, during the process of spinning out a company from the university is kind of all the struggle that you go through and, and what it needs. So this motivated me also to become a bit active in the field, and I am working in, in several organizations. One I wanted to highlight here is the uh, European Innovation Council. So this is some work we are doing together with the uh, European Commission, especially the Commissioner for Innovation, Maria Gabriel, and we are making sure that this process actually is, is getting easier and easier for scientific founders. Um, so the idea is that when you come from the academia, maybe you know the ERC concept, and the idea is if you have some groundbreaking ideas there, and then you want to do the kind of entrepreneurship that we kind of seamlessly kind of uh, take on from this, and I would always encourage everyone who has good ideas to try to, to do the step, because becoming an entrepreneur is a really exciting journey. Uh, just to give you one number, per year we are about uh, uh, to invest 2 billion euros into technology startups in Europe. So this is really a big effort, trying to make Europe competitive on the, on the technology side, not only quantum, but many of them. Coming back to quantum, what we do with IQM is we build the systems based uh, on a superconducting approach. And maybe two points that I, I agree with, with everything that has been said. Two points maybe I want to make. One is, again, the systems overview. And what we think is that for near-term applications, it's very important to uh, map the hardware, the, the, the layout and design of the processors to the actual algorithms and applications. And this means you need to cover the know-how throughout the stack if you want to do this mapping. And, and I think this is something uh, that will be very important if you want to be hardware um, efficient. And another point um, that we think is super important is the integration into environments uh, where quantum computers will be used in the future. And we strongly believe that a large fraction will be in supercomputing um, centers. And there, for example, um, it's a lot about interfaces and standards. So if you go and visit a supercomputing center, you see, for example, very little um, amount of SMA connectors, but they just use different connectors, right? So this is a question. We work in our bubble, but then computing centers, they work with their standards. So how do we bring those things together? And I think this is something that we need to talk about because one of the most obvious applications for high-performance computing is error correction, where probably you need quite a powerful computer to implement the, the error correction. But this means you need to kind of connect those two devices and, and I think this is also a topic that is relevant here in, in this framework where we talk about control and electronics and these topics. So these are two my, my, my two points, the, the system know-how and then the integration and, and standardization of things. Thank you, Jan. And uh, with this we finally come to Michael. Uh, you can... Um, oh, I'm allowed to Michael has the, the uh, special uh, task of 
defending the photonic quantum computing, so he gets the freedom of having an additional slide. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so, hello, it's great to be here. Um, and uh, just a few words. I'm, by training, I'm a teacher. I'm a math and physics teacher who did then a PhD in physics at the Max Planck Institute in Erlangen. Then I went to the US to Boulder and worked two years at NIST. And from this on, I moved into industry. And then in 2018, actually, we founded uh, Quant as a spin-off of Trumpf. What we do, we focus on photonics in order to realize photonic quantum computing and quantum sensing. And uh, today, it's all about quantum computing. We focus there on the chip. And uh, to introduce this slightly into this very different approach, the good thing with photonic qubits is also the drawback. Um, they do not like to interact. So, in one sense, it's great because we have outstandingly long coherence times. On the other hand, it's a really tough job to get a controlled Seagate, for example. And that's the reason um, why we, as a photonics community, sometimes have to take a bit of a different approach. Um, and some errors are missing on this slide, but I'm walking you through this. So, for us, it's rather easy to scale the number of qubits. Um, for example, having a thousand qubits, even having them connected, is not really a big issue. The big issue is now to perform deterministic operations with this. But the question is, do we and then end up in this universal error-corrected quantum computing um, um, scenario, which is on the very right, very um, upper corner? Um, if I'm summarizing from my perspective the path um, all other approaches, including the superconducting community currently are doing, um, you're approaching this NISC era, meaning you can perform gate operations with a um, comparably small number of qubits, but you can actually perform all gate operations. And in this era, you basically start to um, uh, start your business and uh, perform algorithms and uh, provide solutions. With the photonics, we exactly go the opposite direction. Um, since we, it's, it's rather hard to have all these gates available, we scale the number of qubits very rapidly, and what we end up is in this uh, right uh, lower corner. There is an algorithm, um, which is here uh, declared as boson sampling. It just means you interfere as many photons with each other as possible in a controlled way. And uh, this um, inherently is already a matrix operation. And in this boson sampling era, you can address NP-complete problems. And this is basically the first idea. This is, so to say, the first step. Um, we're looking from, from the problem's point of view. We're looking into the NP-complete era, where you, for example, have um, issues like max click detection problems, or you have, uh, you have for example, sub-dense um, subgraphs, subdense graphs calculations, or in other words, if you he heard about traveling salesman problem, exactly a traveling salesman problem fits into that class, and it's clear from the algorithms how to map such kind of classical problems on this, uh, so to say, simpler uh, photonic structure. And from this on, we upgrade the systems, and uh, what we then want to approach is a so-called measurement-based cluster state computation, which then is universal. Um, but also, honestly speaking, from a two-day's point of view, it's not 100% clear how to come from the boson sampling to the universal quantum computing error. Um, this is, there are a lot of hypotheses out there. Um, a lot of theoretical paper, but uh, none of them have, be, have been validated in experiments. So this is the very different approach, and uh, I was basically, you, you asked me to summarize it on a slide. So if, if, if to summarize what we in the photonics community have as advantages, <coughs> we have extremely long coherence times. They're actually so long that we are not thinking about it. Um, our chips can be operated at room temperatures. Okay, now I have to add the detectors not. They're currently at 4 Kelvin, but even in comparison to other systems, this is quite hot. Um, our systems are continu uh, our qubits are continuously moving, um, and they, um, which means if we want to connect, for example, one chip to another, it's not a big issue because, again, the coherence length is long and they like to, to, to travel. Um, and if we need new qubits, we can just generate them. So there is no big issue of generating even more qubits. 
Um, and the system, once, I mean, um, what you do is you basically realize this photonic system today in photonic integrated circuit styles. You're using semiconductor uh, process technology in order to generate your waveguides. And by this, you have uh, access to a production uh, and fabrication methods from semiconductor industry, which itself has demonstrated to be scalable. Coming to our own architecture, we've, what we at Quant do, we start the process, the complete process, with two wafers, and from this point uh, on, we uh, own the complete fabrication process on our own. The key behind is that, we, um, that our systems rely on a particular material, which is called lithium niobate. In essence, it has the highest nonlinearities in the photonics, meaning we can generate the photonics states, which we need, very uh, efficient. And we also can apply very high modulations um, in this field naturally. And underneath there is silicon, which is then the electronics control layer in order con to control the photonic circuits. An additional advantage is that we can do everything monolithic. So from the first generation of qubits till the detection, the complete chip is one single material, one chunk of material. There is, we do not need to dope or we do not need to have some intersections in there. Um, everything can be tailored in one system. And the gate operations in that sense, the simple one, the interference operations can perform up to gigahertz. So we are not limited here. And this is just to give an idea how the photonics approach is and what our contribution to this is. Okay. Thank you, Michael. And uh, maybe uh, let's just stick with it a little bit. So we have extremely long coherence types. Is there a class of problem that comes to your mind where this approach really has a, an advantage over the other uh, spin qubit superconducting uh, uh, technology platforms? So it's of course, it's always hard to say. I mean, you need to be an expert in your system in order to know the pros and cons. So I can only argument uh, from the perspective of a photonics person. Um, this very long coherence lengths, I mean, what they, for example, I've shown this Gaussian boson sampler. Um, we just recently uh, determined the use case, which means it's the, gate, uh, the airport gate assignment problem. Meaning you want to, um, to assign airports that come, uh, if, if airplanes that come into an airport uh, to the right gate, um, optimizing under certain boundary conditions. Now this, the operation itself is rather simple, but you need um, on the order of uh, 10 to 20,000 qubits coherently connected. This is doable on a photonics platform rather simple because the calculation itself in the gate you need is just interference and the connection of 10,000 qubits coherently is also not really a big problem. I take your word. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, then maybe along the same lines, um, Jan, you already m you mentioned the uh, classical quantum interface. And I think this is a critical thing on all of all for all the technologies that we're now discussing. Um, how how can the how can we push the quantum advantage from the classical side? Uh, error error correction stabilization is one topic you mentioned. Uh, do you have an additional ad vision where the classical side can actually accelerate quantum advantage? Well, I think. Um, there are, let's say, direct and indirect methods to do so. I mean, if you look at the class, like the semiconductor chip industry, um, it has, uh, let's say, the self self acceleration effect because the chips that have been developed have been used to develop better next generation chips, right? And I think this is a concept that we also see in quantum uh, more and more, where the development on all fronts actually go in into the quantum chips. So you can think about um, the design optimization of the layout. Um, there are so-called EDA tools in, in classical chips, uh, where um, basically the same concept applies to, to quantum chips. And, and um, there's a lot of computational power needed for designing and simulating this. But then, of course, during the, the computation itself, I mean, the current approach, uh, one well-known um, approach is this VQE, where you have this kind of uh, variational algorithm. But when I talk to, to, for example, if you talk to uh, companies in the life science field, where it's about drug um, discovery or so, currently, um, these molecules are way too big for any quantum computer. But one 
one approach that some players are having is that they kind of try to identify smaller subsets and then solve them on, on quantum processors. But then to identify those, again, you need a supercomputer to kind of do this and, and the simulation around it. So I think um, as we now kind of get into the use cases and connect the different worlds, so for example, life science experts with the quantum experts, we will explore on the fly a lot of possibilities where a classical system and a quantum system can benefit from each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. And um, maybe to continue with Anna, because you're also kind of looking at the full stack, your approach is this modular. What's the role of classical control in your modular approach of the design? Is this uh, also yeah. in terms of interfaces and scaling? Yeah, um, I would say um, classical control for us plays a really important role. Um, not so much directly at the chip level at the moment, but um, with the entire control stack. And um, yeah, we have put a lot of effort into um, trying to reduce the latency um, of the system overall. So we benefit a lot from having um, fairly short communication times between the, the quantum system and the classical compute. And that will become, like as we go forward, this is becoming more and more important. Um, for example, we, we need to bring in more and more classical logic also in, into these quantum operations. So we're looking at things like mid-circuit measurement, for example, becomes really important and different types of feedback become important. Um, those things also, they, they come up um, in the context of, of error correction. So for us, the, all of that can, can really be optimized and aided a lot by um, playing yeah. your cards right with classical compute and it definitely mm -hmm. comes in there. Yeah, uh, I now heard a really interesting thing. Um, so generally, uh, those interfaces are really important and then you mentioned the mid-circuit readout and now we come to the photonic world. Mid-circuit readout, is this a topic? Yes. Oh, it is. <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, not for uh, not for the boson sampling approach, but uh, uh, for scaling it to the universal approach. Um, in order to generate these states, the, the the interesting universal quantum qubit states, for example, GKB states, they are called. You need to read out in between, and then conditioned on that read out, uh, make a transfer to one of your modulators and modulate your state before it's detected at the detector. So, in that sense, yes, it plays an important role. I get it. Very diff. If I get it right, though, it's a very different role it plays. It's more kind of a control role yep. versus an error correction role. Yeah. Got it. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I think the uh, quantum classical interface also for the spin qubits plays a big role. Uh, Natalia. I know your vision is to make everything automatic, uh, like the machine learning, um, with the having having the scale scaling up in the back of your head. Uh, where do you see the challenges on the quantum classical interface for spin qubits and also artificial intelligence uh, operation of uh, quantum computers? Well, definitely, you know, you mentioned the 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 role of uh, companies like uh, Zurich Instruments and uh, piling up, uh, you know, uh, the instruments that we need in terms of um, controlling, uh, well, sending the signals and and analyzing the signals that we receive from our devices. And in fact, um, in the beginning, uh, well, it, it depends, you know, how fast are your measurements, of course. But something we think very often about is. What's the time it takes us uh, to perform, uh, um, well, to make a decision using a machine learning algorithm and how much time it takes us to perform a measurement, right? Because that, that, that balance between these two quantities is what also they dictates which are the machine learning approaches uh, that are going to work and that are worth pursuing. Now, of course, that um, touches also on uh, latency. 
because if you were to have that uh, machine learning um, control seating very close to your chip, then uh, you know there are there are uh, things that uh, you can do a lot faster. So uh, we start uh, talking a lot about well, that there are uh, research groups actually focusing on uh, cryoelectronics and uh, you know really seating your AWG next to your uh, chip at, at low temperatures. And also, um, in that sense, all uh, FPGA type of, of control, and if we can actually combine as well this control with our machine learning approaches in terms of um, you know sending the best balls, uh, avoiding uh, some uh, particular um, uh, you know uh, tr traps or some particular. Um, extra states that you that you can find so that integration at low temperature um or, or even thinking about latency of of uh, decisions and signals uh, reaching uh, your chip and in which conditions it, it reaches your chip of course uh, which for high frequency uh, signals is is uh, definitely uh, quite important is something we we think a lot about so if I understand you right, you have a strong vision to also bring your work into the coherence time of the quantum computer. Exactly. Well, I mean, one one has to think that as a as a as a possible thing to 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 look into. And I, there are there are quite some efforts um, on these. And and I know, um, for example, David Rayleigh's group uh, that that looks into uh, electronics at low temperatures. And um, uh, well, we are we are thinking as well and, and working on our side and on on shifting our our control algorithms as well. Um, to low temperatures. Yeah, so, so far I've heard the classical quantum interface, mid-circuit readout, coherence time feedback, that's kind of in there, increasing the duty cycle, making it faster, uh, HPC integration, connecting it with a supercomputer, those are kind of the uh, driving things there. Um, Stefan? Do you have uh, something to add along these lines? Yeah, maybe one point I would like to point out because of what Jan said, actually, that there is this uh, cycle in semiconductor industries that you basically get uh, a return on investment on your investment. And the question is then actually whether we are there here in the quantum uh, domain, and I think we are not there yet. And the question is then actually whether that's a, a one of the challenge, because I think all of the problems that we are actually dealing with is, okay, we throw now classical compute power onto our quantum devices, onto our quantum electron or, or electronics for this, try to design and optimize, I would even say that the quantum devices that we have right now wouldn't be there if we don't have the compute power and all the HPCs that we have around. But the question is then at some point, can we use quantum computing for solving one of these problems, like some finite elements, some FEM simulations, electric field simulations that helps us then designing better qubits, better devices, better materials. And I think that's, uh, I would be, that would be the vision at the end that we come with our quantum computing also to this stage where we see some return on the investment. And that's kind of, uh, I think, an interesting vision to have, and we should have this vision. I'm thinking, when could this be reached at this point? Well, that's a very good question, actually. <laughs> when will this be reached that we could... There's this uh, general, it seems, kind of uh, axiomatic rule that uh, we, as people, underestimate, overestimate what we can get done in one year and underestimate what can be done in 10 years. So maybe let's look at something like five years. Do you think it's uh, realistic to close this loop in five years, Jan? So I, think, what do you I think? mean, there are two groups of people. One thing you definitely need error correction, and the other group thinks maybe it can be done in this NISC era. And I think if you need error correction, then five years is very challenging, <laughs> I would say. Um, so the question is, is there a quantum advantage in the NISC world? And of course, um, we kind of strongly believe in this, and, and we, this is why we think streamlining the, hard, the, the layout of the processor to the um, algorithm is, is one way to go to reduce the requirements, for example, on the qubit count. 
Um, I think here the topic is about the 1000 qubits, so I think this should be the goal, to find an algorithm where we can reach quantum advantage within 1000 and maybe a few hundreds. I don't know the number. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows the number. Um, but I think this is what many people are working for. And then if you just look at the roadmaps that different companies have published, um, at least um, there is um, a strong belief that it can be reached within five years, if it ever happens within the NISC era. But this is to be debated, I would say. Yeah, fair, fair. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I see no, nobody's shaking her, his head. We're all in the same boat, this is we all <laughs> believers. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> yeah. Um, maybe... Uh, Let's look uh, into into the scaling challenges that we that you face in your respective uh, technologies. On this, let's let's put let's define five years the horizon we want to look at. Um, <clears throat> so at Rigetti, you're pretty far ahead. You've already covered quite some grounds in terms of scaling. What are the major, like, three challenging uh, things you have to overcome? In, on this five-year uh, time frame? Yeah, um, I would say, so one, one major challenge um, definitely lies in the, in the actual signal chain within the cryostat, how to bring that, how to scale that up um, in a way that we can keep the, the heat load low, that we can actually go to a high qubit count. Um, so yeah, different packaging solutions, different cabling solutions are major challenges in that field. And um, yeah, that's, that's one, one big er area. And the, another one is obviously on, on chip. It's actually scaling up the devices themselves where we have this, this modular approach. But of course, it doesn't, it doesn't just end at the edge of the chip, but you actually have to find routing solutions. You have to find uh, you have to find packaging solutions. You have to be able to to really address um, yeah address the the qubits, read them out um, without any crosstalk issues arising. So yeah, on on the chip itself is is the the second major area I would say. And yeah, it goes. So the third really big area and, and you can talk almost um, more about that than at least as much um, as we can is, um, is on the control electronics side because um, also the, the approach that we've had for a long time just becomes infeasible um, as you go towards a thousand qubits, for example, um, for cost reasons, but also for, for scaling, like for, for actual scaling reasons. Yeah, I know uh, that one uh, very well indeed. <laughs> and if I may add here, the five-year time scale, what we're looking in here, I think what's obvious is that as uh, Zurich Instruments, now part of Rode Schwarz, um, ASICs will also be part of the solution there. It's obvious that on the scaling challenge of bringing down price, power consumption and uh, volume, uh, ASICs will be part of that solution. And on the five-year roadmap, that's uh, something we are definitely working on. Yeah. And you also mentioned the modularity. And I, I understand this is a way of scaling because you don't need to make like huge chips. You can keep them on a, on a, on a handle. Uh, Natalia is... Uh, <laughs> She can probably integrate way more qubits on one chip, but uh, now going to multiple chips, um, can you give us an idea what the new set of challenges are? Mm -hmm. um, there's no free lunch. Yeah, <laughs> that is correct. Yeah, so the the main challenge going to multiple chips is that we need to um, we need to connect them, and we need to connect them in a way that we don't lose any performance. So um, specifically, we have um, we have interchip couplers that connect. So if you if you look at that schematic, basically you can think about it as this this carrier device that then has um, the the chips that, for example, can contain the qubits bonded onto it, and you need to somehow connect qubits that are on these separate um, individual tiles. And for that, we have um, specific interchip couplers. And of course, one of the challenges is to make sure that those 
couplings are um, just as reliable and as good as, as the others. So for example, if you have um, two qubit gate operations across chips, that need, those, those gates need to be as high fidelity as the ones that we could um, drive within the chip. And yeah, that, that is one of the major challenges. Another, but yeah. Is, then, is the vision that this intersection becomes, uh, or the, the, the multi-chip architecture becomes kind of invisible to the uh, theoretical f um, physicist? Or is it that the single modules are kind of partitioned in a way that the uh, theoretical physicist c can make best use of? Um, it's really such that um, we, we currently already have one of those modular devices up um, for users on the cloud. And it's really such that the users cannot, uh, the, the, for the users, it doesn't show up. Like they can just use it. And, and that is our job, basically, to make sure that that's the case, that users can just use it without noticing where, the, where one chip ends and the next one begins. Yeah, so that's uh, the scaling on the superconducting side. Uh, spin qubits, what's your view on that, Nata uh, Natalie? Um, in terms of uh, how to connect different uh, nodes or different... Um, yeah, or, well, there are you know, is, is it at all a topic for you to go kind of multi-chip in, the, in, the, in five years? <laughs> well, I, so here in my lab, we don't, uh, we are not focusing on, let's say, um, on that in particular, but... Uh, because definitely we have been uh, focusing on the control and... and how we would go with tuning and characterizing, let's say, a, a node of two, three, four uh, qubits. And then uh, the question is, well, once you have three, four, five qubits, uh, would you continue going in terms of machine learning? So would you, would you go about the task of controlling these devices by, uh, you know, taking the southern qubits and, and, and optimize their parameters. And I think that's not a very smart idea. So probably the best thing to do is to optimize in, in, in groups, no? So in, in a bunch of two, three, four. And this is what we are focusing at the moment, trying to see what what, what is the, the size of this uh, chunk that, that machine learning control um, can, can take and can uh, automate completely and then the question is well how would you go about you know uh, uh, communicating these different uh, nodes and on these there are groups that are making uh, fantastic uh, uh, advances in the terms of what they do is couple with resonators for example you can couple uh, spins in in different shapes by by coupling the but because you have you can couple these spins to uh, waveguides and so you, to uh, superconducting resonators. Now, this is, has a disadvantage naturally, and it's the fact that, okay, uh, if, we for, if we couple to superconducting resonators, we need space to do that. And, and again, you know, uh, that, that is a consideration that has to, um, to be considered. So another approach is actually cop coupling these uh, different nodes by bigger kind of um, uh, semiconductor devices such as, you know, you have this jelly beans uh, approach uh, from, from Copenhagen. And, and the idea there is that you use this kind of, uh, you know, electron uh, paddles to, to uh, couple the different devices in different uh, parts of your chip and, and different chips. Uh, I guess you could do um, by, by resonators. So, so, you know, there are different um, ways to, to couple these. And, and there are some approaches, for example, in donors in silicon, where uh, you could think of uh, coupling these donors in, in, in quite far away, uh, from quite far away, like, I don't know, 100 nanometers away. Uh, that for us is quite far. <laughs> um, and, and then the conditions or the needs in terms of what you would have to fit in, where you would have to fit in these resonators, um, of course, changes. Uh, so yeah, as a community, there are different kind of plans in terms of coupling, but it's um, it's it's indeed uh, quite tricky. Uh, already, uh, what what you can see is if you if you kind of 
um, what we have experienced is that if you if you make this array linear, you have less uh, crosstalk. But shall, shall you do it? You know, you might want to do it in a in a two D architecture, where of course crosstalk is a bit more of a problem. But that's that's what I think machine learning is for, no, to compensate for that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, crosstalk and scaling is uh, something that is uh, in conjunction good for a lot of headache. <laughs> Stefan, I think, uh, what, what do you, uh, what, what, what's your take on this headache as we go forward? Do we, will, how will we master, do we, will we master the crosstalk challenge putting on more superconducting qubits on single devices? Will you shift the headache over to us to come up with the dense compensation matrices? How, yeah. how big do you see the challenges, the challenge of crosstalk um, in the superconducting yeah, world? Um, maybe that's an interesting point. We could just shift the responsibility to the others. <laughs> to the <laughs> can shift the responsibility to the design team. They could make actually better qubits so that they are less crosstalk, or to those who are working on 3D integration and say, okay, please solve me the problem. Also shift it to the electronic side and say, okay, we can all do with some better control pulses. <laughs> I think. So awesome. what is the point at the end is I think we have to work on all of these different directions. And whether it's solvable or not, I mean, in the superconducting qubit world, we see that it's kind of uh, having not the perfect qubit, of, but these unharmonic qubits causes a nice way to do gates, but also cause, causes lots of troubles. So maybe then the point is, can we figure out what is a better qubit? And then I think the challenge, which I also see now, Natalia, if you are talking about semiconductor quantum dot, there I see it in the superconducting qubit, it starts maybe again or so, this question about what is actually the right system to use, this decision challenge or this specification challenge. Are we actually on the right track? And shall we focus more on a specific technology and solve all these problems that we have in this technology? Or shall we stay rather broad and then try different, different types of being qubits in one of the system in, in a specific system or trying different systems. At the moment I think we're in a good situation that there is lots of possibilities and also lots of funding available to explore different directions. But that might change and then we have to narrow down our efforts. And I think that's okay now we're going a little bit astray of the CC type coupling question. <laughs> but that's kind of maybe a way how to solve this is also be exploratory uh, still and try to keep this this aspect, and that's clearly coming from a university point of view because also that's the that's the role that we are in in exploring a, a little bit around the not beaten path yet, but the standard path. Ah, sounds good. Um, and um, Michael, when you listen to these folks talking about their challenges, are there some you can identify with? Definitely not CC that coupling. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's true. <laughs> no, basically, um, I see most most of the challenges you've been basically addressing are the same for the photonics architecture as well. So, you raise the horizon to five years. I, even if I span it to 10 or 15, I see that uh, quantum computers, regardless which kind of platform, are part of uh, HPC. So we need to integrate it there, and then, well. The, 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 this complexity on its own applies to all platforms. If we go particularly on the photonics, um, so we have all this plus <laughs> <laughs> even more challenges. No, um, I mean we. What NISC is uh, to, to 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 the semiconductor world um, is the boson sampler for us, and it's hard to predict how many qubits we need. Um, so we, we know how to apply the algorithms, but uh, since we cannot simulate the system, it's hard to anticipate whether it's 200, 1,000 or 10,000 qubits until we see the break, even for outperforming a classical operation um, uh, using a quantum chip. So this, this is the one approach, and for the universal, um, it's even more severe. Um, within the next five years, I think we have to come up with an idea how a universal quantum computing algorithm looks like on a photonics platform. So, and demonstrate it at least in, in, in portions of that, um, which is then a very fundamental problem. Or if photon, the photonics approach will always be focusing on the special purpose error. 
I see. So you sort of have uh, are following kind of two visions. One is the universal track, and the other one is kind of the more application-specific analog type of uh, track. Yeah, makes sense. So here we have at least now two ways how to measure progress towards different goals. Um, Anna, what's your? How would you like to measure? progress in scaling. I mean, easy method is, uh, not saying it's a clever one, count the, count the qubits. What, what would you propose as a, as a North Star metric to measure our progress towards better and better scaling quantum computers? Yeah, um, in a sense, yeah, for scaling alone, Counting the number of qubits isn't isn't a bad approach. Obviously, they need to be um, connected, and they need to be connected with with gates that are sufficient quality to to actually make use of um, of a device of a certain size. And then, yeah, and then different metrics come in where performance, yeah, where you basically have a combination of the performance and the the number of qubits. And yeah, when I mean, one example that's very commonly used is quantum volume for that, um, and there are there are others that, um, yeah, that are, are similar in a sense. Uh, so I, I I think those are in they they are useful at the moment, but in the end, I, I think we will need to come we will need to come to a point where we can use basically application specific metrics where we can really look at specific algorithms and judge the performance of a system based on the res like how it performs um, with certain algorithms because that in the end is, is what actually matters and every yeah because the systems become so complex that that all the different aspects need to be taken into account and they only get taken into account in a in a full um, application so such yeah. a benchmark wouldn't be an, a benchmark that is exclusively quantum related it would also depend on the performance of classical components yeah exactly that that all comes in and um and obviously if you have a benchmark that's that's based on the performance of a specific algorithm that's also not platform dependent anymore so you can't right now it's difficult to use the same um, the same benchmark to compare between different platforms, between a photonic quantum computer and superconducting, for example, is really difficult, but then it would be uh, more feasible. Do you already have some experience uh, with in any such uh, kind of benchmark? It's, uh, currently, I would say it's, there, there are some people looking into that more, but it's, yeah, a lot of it is, is research publication is essentially yeah the, the results that are claimed in in different research publications about about those applications mm -hmm. um, anybody else here has a, a kind of like high level benchmark uh, that you have actually utilized or do you maybe maybe to start with do you support that idea <laughs> Yes, definitely. definitely. I think there is even a toolkit available where you can run it on the different platforms, like they did this comparison about the uh, ion traps and so the qubit platforms, mm -hmm. and then you see for different algorithms basically how good they perform, whether that's then really the metric at the end. I think the real hard metric at the end is usability and practicality, so what can you use it for? I could even say like user base, how many users do you have on a specific system, but that probably comes then a little bit afterwards once we have these systems that are widely available. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you also meant in the beginning you said price per channel, volume and power consumption. You can just replace channel with qubit, right? It's a similar thing. So one thing that worries me, for example, if I go to the lab um, and is um, the size, you mentioned this also, of the components. So if you look at, let's say, circulators, right? And each circulator is, I don't know, has some s uh, centimeters in all dimensions and it weeks, uh, let's say, a few hundred grams. So if you talk about 1,000 qubits, you put there 1,000 circulators or isolators, you have a few hundred kilos just isolation with magnetic isolation in the fridge. So if you, again, I like uh, analogies from the semiconductor industry, there actually we use the nanometer scale as a benchmark, right? 12 nanometer, 7 nanometer. And at least in the superconducting community, what is happening, people say, okay, we 
do more qubits, we need more space, we go to the cryostat builders, they build us a bigger cryostat, right? And it becomes bigger and bigger, whereas actually in semiconductor industry, things are getting smaller and smaller. So I think at some point, we need to get a paradigm shift from trying to just fit in, um, yeah, in to whatever volume we get into making things smaller. And usually also if you look at innovation, it's driven by having, re uh, let's say, limited resources. And so I think if someone would say, okay, this is the biggest cryostat we built, now you put kind of, now you need to start miniaturizing. I think this would be a big innovation driver. So um, I, I guess there's still a lot of things to do, especially on this front, how we just make it more compact, cheaper and, and less power consumption. Thank you for that idea. <laughs> I will immediately calculate how many kilograms per qubit our equipment is <laughs> and see whether we are on a good track. <clears throat> no, but you're right, absolutely. <clears throat> and um, what's that in the photonic world? How, how would you measure the progress towards bigger, more powerful system, what do you think is uh, appropriate? Is it quantum value, uh, quantum volume, or do you have another metric that is maybe even on a lower level that would be good? No, we, we actually don't. So um, what we account for is solving problems. It's, so it, it's really as simple as it is, and I, I really like the approaches which have been discussed here, and um, the question that just came up when Yuyan said it, aren't we a bit too early in time for these comparisons? I'm taking a bit of a provocative statement here. First of all, shouldn't we demonstrate something that's better than what we have? We would define, for example, problems, a certain type of four to five problems, and then we let all platforms try to calculate it, regardless whether I need two, five, or ten fridges. Um, but first of all, demonstrating that there is an advantage using quantum. I mean, we all take this as granted, but it's not given. Um, it's not given. We believe in that, but it's not given. We have to demonstrate it first. And then once we demonstrate it, that these platforms can give a contribution to um, all these simulation calculations we want to perform, then we can start comparing which one is the best in terms of kilograms, energy efficiency, and so on and so forth. I mean, we didn't start, I mean, of course, in Germany, you compare it with the automotive industry, but we didn't outline the three liter engine. Uh, when we just started to have uh, the first Mercedes, right? True. So um, in that sense, I would say I go with it. Uh, let's define some class of problems and then regardless, and no one should argue, oh, my platform, for example, also taking the photonics one, we, we must not argue, oh, we can't do gate operations. It, it's, it's, it's irrelevant, right? We have to solve the problem. And if we can't solve the problem, this platform probably won't survive. How would you then assess that what's going on right now in also optimization algorithms, then the classical computing then actually improves and improves and the quantum computing then tries to catch up? Is this already some progress that you would to take uh, I like as, it. A, as I a good thing to have some kind of a driver behind that? I mean, I've, I've, I like it that we drive progress in the classical information uh, theory. It, 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 it's a progress, right? I mean, it's not the progress where we were targeting for, but it's a progress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, progress. I think it's uh, on time to kind of come to our kind of last round of questions here before we open to the entire group of people here. So, five-year horizon, what are your five-year roadmaps kind of goals? And uh, you are free to choose uh, the, <laughs> the way on uh, how you measure it. Is it uh, to have solved a certain problem uh, or um, to have uh, reached a certain number of qubits that you can entangle? That's totally up to you. Um, actually, um, it's very interesting for me to to learn, I, I think Natalia will have a very different idea for what she will, what she wants to have done in five years than uh, people working more on hardware. Maybe Natalia, let's start with you. So five-year roadmap, uh, where, how, how do you see the way ahead and uh, what's going to be the big milestone that you want to see happening in five years? Well, I mean, in terms of, you know, our roadmap, my lab's roadmap, I, I want to show uh, that already we have shown that we can 
use the same machine learning algorithms to tune, for example, uh, different uh, semiconductor devices, which in principle have very different architectures. Now I want to, we want to show really that we can, um, I think, create a bit of a community in terms of tuning and control between different um, qubit realizations, so between ion traps and superconducting qubits and photonics. And I, I want to create a bit of a, let's say, a control community in which we can say, look, you know, we have these algorithms, we can optimize the qubit performance and we can work together uh, to do that in different platforms. So this is basically one of the main goals uh, now from uh, at least that, that my group has in mind. And the second, well, thing that we are we are developing uh, here is, as I said, the energetics of this. So I want to know in five years, <laughs> for sure, uh, you know, is it, is it uh, that, um, can you can you extract work from coherence? Can you know what what is the thermodynamics of uh, when when it comes to nanoscale devices in terms of fluctuations, in terms of quantum effects? So that's something um, that I think we need an answer to. Uh, and um, this is for sure what we would be focusing on pushing uh, the uh, the control and in terms of in terms of everything in terms of speed and in terms of breadth of architectures and uh, from a more fundamental point of view trying to understand how how the thermodynamics of these systems uh, evolve um, and 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 this is you know what we want to achieve but, but but very different is what i want to see achieved <laughs> and this is my wish list <laughs> and uh, i think you know i think it's it's um, amazing how much progress has been done um, Semiconductors, for example, have been, you know, where it's there are systems in the solid state that are quite difficult to control, and we've seen a lot of progress on that. And we have seen, uh, you know, systems get to 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 go through um, past the the thresholds of error correction, and that's amazing. So I think that, and, and I'm amazed by the the the. Um, the progress on superconducting qubits too. So, indeed, what I want to see is uh, is that we keep up with the good work, and and that we can say in five years that we have made substantial progress in a way that we can uh, really, as um, uh, as we were saying, you know, close. Uh, well, not not show that we that that we are stuck, that we are making progress, even if it's uh, it's slow. It's a difficult problem, and I think we. The main message we have to give to to uh, well from the university, I guess, to companies and and uh, is is that we need to be patient and there are lots of you know uh, challenges ahead. But the current uh, speed of progress also shows that it's it's possible if uh, if if we set our minds to it and and we shouldn't we shouldn't slow down. Good, thank you, Natalia, and uh, Jan. How about your five year? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, we strongly believe in uh, some NISC advantage, at least for, let's say, very selected use cases. So, and, and we think what you need for this is a few hundred qubits, not sure how many exactly, probably four nines around of, of fidelity. Um, so these would be the, the, the technical milestones, a few hundred qubits, four nines, and then have identified the algorithm that runs on a certain chip topology, because then we think you create this, this quantum advantage, and this then, of course, helps then again developing the field. But I think, but these are not technical milestones. I think one thing also that we should always have in mind, and I think this is why it's great to have a user meeting like this, is that we need to make sure we get the people also then to, to work on this. And I think this is already now very challenging for all of us to get good people um, to, to work with us on this exciting journey. And I, I guess this is something that we as a community have to work on to excite more people also from the side who maybe are not have a kind of quantum physics PhD or so. To, um, to help us achieving these goals, because at least my current um, learning is that when we bring together quantum physicists and then electrical engineers, computer scientists, there are so many learning effects between the community that really accelerates the field. So I think this is very important to, to stress always that we make sure we have the talent that comes from the university. So I think the kind of education is super important, but then also bringing the people in from all different other industries.
Yeah, very good point. So that's uh, definitely a critical success factor. I think every company lab here has open positions. <laughs> it's uh, definitely one of the critical success factors. Do you see other kind of critical things that are maybe a little bit out of your control that need to happen? I don't know, is it multi-fridge technology or uh, uh, cross-chip uh, connectivity? Well, of course, there are many technical challenges. Uh, I don't want to kind of bother people with more technical challenges. I think something that Stefan mentioned is also important, that we are not there yet from the commercial side. This means we are depending on third-party funding quite heavily. Um, and in, in this sense, I think it's important to keep the balance between promising and, and kind of delivering then on, on these promises so um, that the field in itself doesn't see what people call a quantum winter or so, but that we kind of um, set realistic goals and then we deliver. And then this also means that we create the trust, for example, from big industry players or so to so also start supporting the field. Got it. People and funding, and then we have a chance at the couple hundreds. <laughs> I like that. Anna, what's yeah. your take on that? Yeah, I, I definitely agree with, with that. Um, both of that is extremely important um, for, for us and I think for everyone else in this industry as well. Um, yeah, in, in terms of actually um, the, like our roadmap goals for the next five years, um, obviously we have goals in terms of scaling up, going to higher qubit numbers in our systems. And uh, that's, yeah, so there we, we want to go towards um, a thousand qubits and and beyond um, as we we also strongly believe that in that NISC regime that we can really fully enter then we can actually come to to quantum advantage but again it's not so clear what that will actually look like in detail what's clear for us is that by just going larger with the basically the systems we have right now we will not reach that and we, we really need to make some fundamental changes to increase the performance of our systems as well. So our next um, our next goal is actually not going to a larger system, so it's just going from 80 to 84 qubits basically. So it's really not about making it bigger but making it better and um, yeah, basically unlocking higher performance two qubit gates and um, giving us more more options there and that's yeah, that's the, the most important next step that we have on our roadmap. Got it. And Stefan? I think from my side I can just jump in or uh, mention also from the technical side it would definitely be also along this direction. I think it's going towards this, a few dozens of qubit but with high quality, maybe different types of qubit, different types of couplers and adding some, some new insights in how to build actually a better technology which is then actually scalable or where we see for example that we could master CC crosstalk or something like that. So that's I think on the technical side what would be the challenge for the next five years. Maybe I would envisage to sit here again in five years and then have a completely different list of challenges on the technical side and then master the next round of uh, challenges. More on the political side, I would s actually see this vision of growing this community or bringing it together or maturing this community that we have now uh, initiated here in Munich, Germany, European, and then also so that it becomes basically a a large community which can compete with the rest of the world, but also compete with nature, uh, against nature in building this quantum computer. Wow, that's a nice perspective. I have not considered that one yet. <laughs> Let's beat nature. <coughs> Let's trick nature. Yeah, okay. yeah. Nature yeah. seems to be against us in building the quantum <laughs> computer. <laughs> Good one. Yeah, so five years, Michael. It's a long time. <laughs> um, asking a company being four years on the planet uh, what will be in five years is tough <laughs> um, no it can just can i mean it's it's hard to be the last but uh, all statements are absolutely valid and uh, i think um, I, we shouldn't over raise it um, so i i'm happy i'm personally happy if in five years any platform has demonstrated um, in the NISC era, whatever you call that, uh, that we have a classical algorithm that's meaningful, that solved the problem, which uh, basically is contributing to some bigger problem. Um, and we used um, any kind of platform for this. And uh, all the technology um, should be underpinned to this. 
to this vision. So then I'm then I'm happy. I think uh, I, I I share that. If we do have a proper contribution to mankind that is based in quantum, I think we're safe for a quantum winter. <laughs> and that's already a big win. Um, well, I think something that, that we all said has to do with the Lina Vitofa community. And I think because we share challenges and we share, uh, for example, uh, you know, needs for cryogenic uh, systems that can do this and that and wiring that can do this and that and control that can do this and that why, why you know building that community that that goes across different platforms and um it's, it's something very important so i i think getting more together would will help yeah good so thank you everybody and uh, now i'd like to ask the auditorium if there's uh, questions to any of the people sitting here. Please raise your hand. Mm, I see somebody is kind of in superposition there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have a question to Michael. Um, which is also in the very first part. So, so you mentioned that you deal with uh, also NP complete problems like the traveling salesman, um, how, how does that work with the general idea that a quantum computer shouldn't be able to solve those in polynomial time, or at least it's strongly suspected? That's, in, that's indeed a very good question. So, um, um, referring to this, I mean, may, let me answer it differently. I mean, we found routes and algorithms to map it on our structure. Um, what I cannot promise that we are faster or if we complete the race. So what we at the given moment, what we understand is how to take the, the classical algorithms, how to write a transfer function onto our chips. And then uh, in the future, once we have these chips, <laughs> uh, perform the calculation. But uh, I cannot guarantee that uh, we are um, at, that we are faster. We believe we are faster. This is why we stepped on that race. Um, but this has to be demonstrated. Thanks. Anybody else? Well, then uh, I think it's time to uh, thank our uh, panel uh, participants here. Thanks for uh, coming over. Thank you for uh, the interesting discussion. Uh, I enjoyed this very much. Oh, and of course, uh, <laughs> Uh, we do have a substantial thank you also. We brought that from Zurich. It is uh, uh, something that usually everybody likes. <laughs> yeah, thank you. We will well. bring you something this year. <laughs> okay. Oh. Good. Circle, circle, circle. So, for the speakers, uh, mm -hmm. the scientific uh -huh. talks, mm -hmm. we also still have a little, little uh -huh. presence, but like you want to wrap No, no, you, you, I, I'm done, I think. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, hand over back to Clemens, and uh, do you need a microphone? Not sure. Possibly, yeah. I can uh, take this one. Okay, uh, yeah, thanks everyone. I, I also, as an additional thank you, we would like to have all the speakers from the contributor talks quickly on the stage. Will be uh, Daniel, Luc, and Max. Please uh, join us. We also have a little thing for you. Yes, um, thank you all for your contribution. Thank you. There's a little. Uh, Giveaway from uh, Zurich Instruments uh, that you, uh, Swiss, uh, Swiss use cases, you will have. Um, okay, thank you very much. Thank you.